while our nation's capital is gripped with stories of Trump's misbehavior, of budget battles, of health care battles, our country's epidemic of gun violence goes on in states are, are around this nation of ours. And here, here to discuss that with us now is Lucy McBath. Uh, Ms. McBath is the mother of Jordan Davis, who was uh, tragically murdered in a, a incident over the playing of music in Florida, in a Florida gas station. Uh, she has taken that tragedy and turned it into activism as Ms. Ms. McBath uh, organizes uh, around the issue of gun violence, gives speeches on the topic, and is a spokesperson for uh, Moms Demand Action. Uh, so first of all, Ms. McBath, thanks for coming on the program. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I'm excited to be able to talk with you today. Well, uh, thank you for that. And, and uh, of course, you have... Uh, you know our, our our deepest sympathies for your loss. I you know, words can't express how how much uh, love and support we send you for that. Um, so tell us a little bit uh, about um, your recent work in gun violence. Then I'd like to get into Florida and specifically uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the organization, if you would. Um, well, I am the faith and outreach leader of Every Town for Gun Safety and act as a national spokesperson for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And we're a bipartisan, a nonpartisan um, gun violence prevention organization that is working with our legislators. We work with um, civic leaders. We work with the faith community. We work with uh, law enforcement. We work with all demographics of the uh, country to um, put some more common sense legislation on the legislative books, uh, creating safer environments for our communities and our families. Um, and we have 50 chapters um, of um, Moms Demand Action chapters all over the country. We've got, you know, over 10,000 uh, uh, gun violence uh, supporters that are actually working with us in this organization uh, to stem the, the, the tide of gun violence so that no one really has to experience the tragedy that I have experienced. Now, uh, let's talk just briefly about that. I mean, I don't, I don't want to relive painful memories for you, but uh, do you think it's fair to say that the tragedy your family experienced uh, was uh, somehow perhaps made more possible by Florida's stand your ground law and the whole notion that somehow in my opinion, any we kind of legitimize the use of gun violence, made it too easy to think that guns are the solution? Absolutely. I, I, I really strongly believe that, you know, the expanded version of Florida Stand Your Ground, which is already deadly, um, it effectively kind of re requires that the criminal defendants be convicted twice, uh, once in front of a judge and once in front of a jury. And I really believe that um, I personally believe that because we were able to win both of our cases, so to speak, and we did get some vindication and justice for Jordan's murder and the attempted murder on the boys that were with him, I firmly believe that is the reason why that uh, the state of Florida is trying to expand their already deadly uh, stand your ground laws, which really gives immunity to the shooter and places far more burden on the victims to really prove that the shooter was, uh, you know, shooting without merit. Well, and it, it, what is what do they consider uh, shooting with merit? I mean, to me, uh, now you you know much more about this than I do, but my impression is that if you feel endangered, you're allowed to shoot. But that's a very vague definition. So how can you prove what what a person is feeling or not feeling in a court of law? Absolutely. You know, the stand your ground law is an expanded version of our common self-defense laws, which every state has. And basically in those common self-defense laws, you know, people are allowed to protect their families, their persons, their territory, but they do have a duty to retreat in the event that that, that threat is no longer there and the threat is alleviated, then you don't have the ability to shoot to kill, ask questions later. With the, ex the expansion of stand ground, what they're doing is law they're watering down that specific law 
they're giving uh, the the perpetrator more leeway to decide for him or herself what what a threat is. And oftentimes you're finding that the shooters are using this law in a way that isn't a credible means to use the law. It's not a credible threat, and it's based upon the perception of a threat. So you're absolutely right. How do you determine in a court of law what is perceived as a real threat or what is an imagined threat? And so with the expansion of Stand Your Ground, you're allowing people immunity um, from being convicted for their heinous crimes. And um, what I did understand and learned so well in the state of Florida is that when people are actually getting their gun permits and they're going through gun training, that, you know, they're teaching this law. They're teaching them, you know, people that want to use guns and firearms, they're teaching them how to use this law and protect themselves, so-called protect themselves within the state of Florida. And so you're giving carte blanche to people being able to, you know, shoot anywhere, anytime, and ask questions later. And I, it's, it's, a, it's a very destructive expansion of Stand Your Ground. And a lot of people are dying senselessly by the law. Now, uh, of course, the most famous acquittal uh, under the Stand Your Ground law, I think, is, is, is uh, George Zimmerman for the murder, and I will use the word murder, of uh, Trayvon Martin. And in that case, if I recall correctly, he not only did not attempt to retreat. He actually pursued Trayvon, got out of the car instead of get use, you know, using his vehicle to leave, got out of the car and confronted Trayvon Martin and uh, eventually shot him. So uh, this is clearly, in my mind, a law that justifies aggression. But let me ask you, uh, has any because there's, to my mind, there's a clear racial element to it. Your, your, your son was murdered by a white man who may have thought he had uh, discretion to get away with it completely because of that stand your ground law. Uh, George Zimmerman seemed to feel he had discretion to go after Trayvon Martin, who was a young black man. Um, has any black person been acquitted on stand your ground for shooting a white person? Not that I'm aware of, and I won't say that that has not happened, but I can tell you that, you know, in the United States, uh, black males between the ages of 15 and 34 are far more likely to be killed with a gun than to die by any other cause. And a lot of that has to do, once again, with the stand your ground laws. Um, you know, the, and we do know that in states that have enacted these, some form of stand your ground law, we know that the so-called justifiable homicide rate against minorities disproportionately goes up. Um, you know, the, the work that I do um, with uh, Every Time for Gun Safety and Moms Demand Action, and we do that research, we do that policy research, so we're following the statistics to back up what we know to be the truth, that since 2005, uh, you know, even particularly within the state of Florida, since Daniel Gatton that those, those justifiable, so-called justifiable homicide rates have gone up disproportionately and always affecting um, black males in particular. You know, we know that even black men is 14 times more likely than a white non-Hispanic man to be shot to death, particularly under these laws. So uh, in terms of the status of the Stand Your Ground law now, as I understand it, Stand Your Ground laws were promoted around the country by groups that included ALEC, which is the American Legislative Exchange Council, Koch Brothers funded, funded group. Uh, and in Florida, uh, I believe, but you tell me if I'm wrong, that the legislature attempted to expand this law even further. And that was, uh, I believe, recently shut down by a judge. Is that correct? Exactly. And so now it will go on to, you know, the state appeals court. Um, but yes, because I mean, what, what's so horrible about this expansion is that, you know, it, it, like I said, it, it requires that criminal defendants be convicted twice. And that's once in front of a judge and once in front of a jury. And, and having gone through that experience myself, having gone through two trials, it places so much, um, you know, just emotional and trauma burden on the families. And then not only that, you're, you're, you're shifting the burden of, which is normally placed on the def um, on the um, defendants, you know, you're shifting that to the prosecuting attorneys. 
And that's just not normally the way the legal system has worked. But that's actually what happened to us. The, the, the burden of proof was shifted to us twice to be able to get some kind of conviction and proving that Michael Dunn was, you know, unlawfully acting uh, when he gunned down my son and shot at the boys. I, so, I, you know, I'm go sorry, ahead, I'm go sorry. Ahead. Um, I, I can't imagine what it's like as a parent myself to not only lose your child, but then see the murderer of your child attempt, in effect, what seems to me, uh, to try to convict him, your son, of having done something wrong in order to get away with the murder he's committed that's deprived you of your child. I can't imagine what that must feel like. Well, it definitely is. It's the most traumatizing thing I've ever had to go through. And I just pray that no one else, and I know families are going through this all the time, but I pray and work very, very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. It's just really difficult when, um, in most of these cases, a lot of the cases, the shooter is claiming stand your ground, and oftentimes there are no other witnesses. And so who's to refute the claim from the shooter? you know, that I was standing my ground, I was protecting myself, I felt threatened, I was in imminent harm, which, uh, of course, in our, and that, and that actually happened with Trayvon's case, but in our case, we actually were very fortunate to have witnesses, the boys themselves were in the car as witnesses, we had uh, people that were, you know, at, at the convenience store, you know, pe uh, people that were in the cars that heard and saw uh, a lot of what happened. So in that regard, we were very, very fortunate, very blessed that we were able to refute the charges of, of Michael Dunn. But there again, he understood the law. He knew what the law said. And what, what he kept saying over and over again is that I feared for my life. I didn't know if the boys were going to, you know, hurt me. Jordan had a gun. They were going to shoot me, all of that. And so had there really not been any more credible witnesses, he may have gotten away with murder. And it's so devastating. And now, Lucy McBath, as you mentioned, a part of the work you're doing is faith outreach. And, um, you know, there are some church communities, faith communities, where certainly in, in, in my upbringing, where I would say those communities tend to be gun oriented. And um, there are others that, that uh, of course, are not. But how is that going? How does that work out in terms of faith outreach and telling this story, getting support from faith communities? Well, I started questioning very early on how, you know, if we're, if we're considered one nation under God, why was, the, why was the faith community not speaking out about this issue? When I know that they have people sitting in their congregations that have been affected by gun violence or know of someone who's been affected by gun violence. And so I begin to question, you know, morally and ethically as a nation under God, why are we not talking about this issue? And I, and I truly believe that is a, it, it's an issue of the heart. By changing people's mindset, you know, you change, if you can pick a person's, a person's heart in their conscience, you know, you get them to start thinking differently about issues and ideas. If you can begin to get them to think differently, then they start acting differently. And if they start acting differently and start really spending time trying to affect change, then, you know, the policy change comes right on the heels of that. And so for me, I always understood that this was about changing people's hearts and minds. And unless we were able to do that, then gun violence, you know, that this was a missing piece in the gun violence prevention arena. This is something that I had, you know, not that I've been in the arena, you know, before Jordan was murdered, but in my experience, even coming into this movement, I began to recognize that this was some element, a huge demographic that no one was engaged in, in you know, in the faith community. And so that's why I know it's, it's so important to have people of faith stand up and and also to remind people that you know guns have no place in churches you know that's diametrically diametrically opposed to the word of god and so i always say for people that consider themselves christians but hardline yeah bring your guns into the sanctuary i'm like well where does it say that in the bible right. are we reading and interpreting the same bible <laughs> right i mean you don't have to you don't have to be the world's most a theologically educated Christian to know thou shalt not kill and um, uh, turn the other cheek, for example. Um, exactly. So, all right, well, uh, well, uh, I, I certainly uh, send you all our love and support and, and uh, 
for the great work you're doing and um, and as I say, you know, our deepest sympathies on your loss. Where can folks go to find out more about your work? Um, actually, they can go to everytown.org or momsdemandaction.org. Uh, we have a lot of uh, statewide and national campaigns on gun violence prevention. We also have a program for called Be Smart, which is educating families and children on uh, child access prevention. We do a lot of work with domestic violence victims that have been affected by gun violence. Um, we're doing a lot of really good work around the country. So once again, they can go to momsdemandaction.org, which is our grassroots organizing, and um, Every Town for Gun Safety for more of the research and policy agenda. All right, well, Lucy McBath, mother of Jordan Davis, gun activist and faith outreach coordinator, uh, thanks for all your great work and thanks for coming on our program. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.